Previously on Physics Ball Z, our heroes discovered the different structures of solids, liquids and gases and also discovered the link between temperature and gas pressure and by using the arrows of state changes they were able to even label sublimation and just when everything was going according to plan they were attacked by this heat curve of water but they leveled up and were able to describe the latent heat of fusion and vaporization and now our heroes have located the nuclear fuel held by the enemy of progress will our heroes have their lifespan halved or will they expose this contaminated content and succeed in physics paper one find out in the season finale of physics ball z Here are the retrieval questions for this lesson, you know what to do. During the change of state, the temperature stays constant. The unit for specific latent heat is joules per kilogram. Veins have valves to prevent the backflow of blood. The top chambers of the heart are called atria. Anodes are positively charged electrodes. Cathodes are negatively charged electrodes. Let's brush up on our knowledge of atoms first. Spend some time completing these challenge questions. The positives in atoms are protons and the negatives are electrons. Atoms are neutral because they have an equal number of protons and electrons. You also need to know how small atoms are. The radius of atoms is 1 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is the equivalent of 0.1 nanometer. And although you see the nucleus looking like this, it's actually 10,000 times smaller than an atom. So that's 1 times 10 to the minus 14 meters. And these two tables here summarize the mass and charge of each type of particle. This model of the atom is called the Bohr model. This states that the atom is, has a dense, positively charged nucleus and negatively charged electrons in specific energy levels. Just by looking at this information on the periodic table, we can work out the number of protons, neutrons and electrons of the atom. We see that we have six protons because the atomic number is six and the particles in the nucleus total 12. Which means that by taking the 12 away from the 6, we can work out the number of neutrons, which is 6. And since it's an atom and has no overall charge, since we've got 6 protons, we must have 6 electrons. See if you can work out this challenge question. The mass comes from the nucleus, of course, which is your protons and neutrons. The mass of electrons is very, very small. It's, you basically don't even count it. We had other models of the atoms before. The Billard Bohr model views atoms like tiny spheres that cannot be divided. This was popularized by this guy called John Dalton. Then we got the Plum Pudding model, which had atoms as positive spheres with negatively embedded electrons. This came from J.J. Thompson after he discovered the electron. A quick side note for us to understand the discovery of radiation now. Way back when, this was how you had to take pictures. And you had this photographic plate that goes inside this device here. And then when light is absorbed by the plate, an image is developed. Now we have this guy, Henry Berkerow. He had a photographic plate that was covered so it was not exposed to light and it left a few things on top. The bottom plate shows what the plate looks like when he actually checked them. Have a go at these challenge questions based on the images that you see here. The photographic plates darken when they absorb light and light is a form of an electromagnetic radiation. We'll cover this in season 2 of Physics Ball Z. Becquerel concluded that it was the uranium salt that was the source of this radiation. You need to understand that this was mad back in the day. It was a direct evidence that there was a sort of light that was invisible to our eyes. Not only that, it could move through solid objects. Finally, the evidence that this invisible radiation could be blocked was the imprint of the key which clearly blocked some of that radiation. 
Now we can move on to alpha particles and how they were discovered. Ernest Rutherford heard about these invisible radiations and he was able to identify three types of radiation. Look at this image, how do you think he was able to work out that there were three types? This was based on their penetrative power. Here is an alpha particle. Now have a go at these challenge questions. Alpha particles have two protons and two neutrons. Since we have two protons, the alpha particle must have a charge of plus two, a two plus charge. Finally, remember that elements are identified by the number of protons that they have. If something had two protons, then its atomic number must be two, and that is helium. Helium is the atom that has an atomic number of two because it has two protons. What's this got to do with atomic models? Let me land. Rutherford asked two of his students to shoot these alpha particles at a thin piece of gold and this is what went down. Remember that back in these days, it was the plum pudding model of the atom that was accepted. His students set up an alpha emitter on one side over here and a piece of gold foil on the other side. Around the gold foil they had these screens that lit up when they were struck by alpha particles. They saw that the majority of the alpha particles went straight to the detector directly behind the gold foil, so it just went straight through. A few of the alpha particles ended up being slightly deflected and hit the detectors at position B, but around 1 in 20,000 had a very high deflection rate and they hit the detectors in position C. This made absolutely no sense if the plum pudding model of the atom was correct. But Rutherford did some calculations and clocked that the only way this made sense if there was a very small, very dense nucleus. It was small enough so that the majority of the alpha particles went straight through, some got deflected when they came close to it, and when they had almost head-on collisions, they had very high deflection. This is how the nuclear model was developed, which is a positively dense nucleus with orbiting electrons around it. However, James Chadwick discovered neutrons, so the atomic model went through another change to include neutrons in the model. Now that we've done all of that, let's move on to radiation. Here I have a graph showing the relationship between the size of the nucleus and how stable the atom is. And the bottom GIF shows what a nucleus could do to make itself more stable. Here are some challenge questions for you to do, you know what to do. It's baked that the bottom image is a nucleus because we can only see protons and neutrons and no electrons. So some of you are probably thinking it's because we see the symbol for uranium but that could be a uranium atom. The main thing is that we only see protons and neutrons in the image. On the graph we see that as the size of the atom increases the stability of the atom decreases. The last activity is 4 marks. The uranium nucleus lost two protons and two neutrons to form thorium. Where did you get thorium from? That's the chemical symbol that you see after the uranium breaks down. Oh. We can summarize all of this like this. Radiation is given out to make radioactive nuclei more stable. Essentially what they're doing is that they're getting rid of their excess energy. Here is a definition that you need to memorize. Activity is the number of particles emitted by a source per second. Nice. See if you can turn this into an equation. Activity is the number of particles emitted over seconds. Now use this equation to work out which source had the greater activity. Was it A or B? Source A will be 800 particles over 30 seconds which gives us 26.7 and source B is 2500 particles over 120 seconds, remember the unit should be in seconds, which gives us 20.8, so source A had a greater activity. We can detect radioactive sources using a Geiger-Miller tube. 
This measures something called the count rate. And for this to happen, the radiation must enter the tube for it to be detected. Think carefully now. Why is the count rate almost always lower than the activity? To answer that question, let me show you what that would look like in a past paper question. The activity is the rate at which a radioactive substance decays. A teacher measured the count rate from a sample of lanthanum 140 using a Geiger Miller tube. Explain why the count rate was less than the activity of the sample. This is worth two marks. The first mark comes from saying that the radiation will be spread in all directions. It's not just moving in one direction. And therefore, only a small amount of that radiation is going to enter the Geiger Miller tube. Okay, so let's look at each type of radiation now in more detail. Alpha radiation are alpha particles, which are helium nuclei. Beta radiation are high energy electrons and gamma radiation are gamma rays. Think carefully, which of these types of radiation would have mass? This one was probably a little bit tricky, you would have clocked that off definitely alpha, but remember electrons also have mass as well, it's just very low, so it's alpha and beta radiation. Gamma radiation are photons, then it's like light, it doesn't have a mass. For this more challenge question, it's asking you where does the mass come from? And the mass is coming from the nucleus, okay? So all these radiations, they're coming from the nucleus, the alpha, the beta, the gamma particles. When discussing atomic structure, we have the mass number on top and the atomic number at the bottom. And obviously the large symbol is the element symbol. Just like in chemistry, the mass number is your number of protons and neutrons and the Atomic number is your number of protons. Alpha decay or alpha emissions, as we saw from Rutherford's um, experiment, are two protons and two neutrons. This means that when a substance undergoes alpha decay, it will give off two protons and two neutrons. This means that the mass number goes down by four and the atomic number goes down by two. Oh my god! It ain't that deep. Remember that the mass number is your protons and your neutrons and the atomic number is your protons. Therefore, the atomic number decreases by 2 because you lost 2 protons and the mass number decreases by 4 because you lost 2 protons and 2 neutrons. The left hand side of your equation is your unstable nucleus. The right hand side shows the stable nucleus and also the helium nucleus that you lost. Let's go a little bit deeper now. The top image is just a reminder of what happens during alpha decay. The bottom image shows the relative masses of the different particles and here I have an unstable atom called jugedium. Have a go at these challenge questions. The relative mass of protons and neutrons are both 1. Jugedium is breaking down by alpha decay, so we need to subtract 4 from the mass number and 2 from the atomic number. This gives us 196 for the mass number and 79 for the atomic number. Since the atomic number is 79, the element that has 79 protons must be what it breaks down to, so jugedium broke down into gold. Beta emissions are high energy electrons. What charge will beta particles be then? There will be one minus or just negative. This is what a beta decay looks like. The mass number is unchanged but the atomic number of the stable nucleus goes up by one. The next activity will show you why this happens. Here I have an atom before and after it undergoes beta decay. Look very carefully here at both images and answer these challenge questions. We see that during beta decay, a neutron is turned into a proton. We initially had 3 protons, 4 neutrons and 3 electrons here. But then we have 4 protons, 3 neutrons and 3 electrons. And it sort of makes sense. A neutron has no charge. 
but a negative electron came out, so the neutron became a positive proton. Since the atomic number is the number of protons in the atom, we gain a new proton, so the atomic number increases by 1. But since the mass of protons and neutrons is equal, the mass number stays the same. See if you can complete this beta decay for jugadium. The mass number will still be 200, but the atomic number goes up by 1, so we now have a new element which is lead, which has an atomic number of 82. We can now move on to this idea of half-life. Here I have a bunch of unstable radioactive nuclei, and then after 10 years, the number of radioactive nuclei goes down to this amount. Now try and answer these challenged questions. Eight atoms decayed into stable atoms, these white atoms. We started off with 16 radioactive atoms, and then after 10 years, we only have 8 atoms left. We halved it, so the half-life is 10 years. Looking at the way the atoms have decayed, we can safely assume that radioactive decay must be a random process. This means that we cannot know which particular atom in a substance will decay at a given time, but we do know that around half of them would have decayed by a certain amount of time, and this, of course, is the half-life. You should define half-life as the time taken for half of the nuclei of a radioactive isotope to decay. Here is an example of alpha decay. You start off with a parent nucleus and that decays into the radiation and a daughter nucleus. Look at this graph. One of the colors shows the parent nucleus over time and the other shows the daughter nucleus. Can you work out which colour represents the parent nucleus and which one represents the daughter nucleus? You start off with 100% parent nucleus, so that must mean the blue line that's decreasing is the parent nucleus and the red line that's going up, that's building up, is the daughter nucleus. You should skip to this video over here if you need a recap of what isotopes are. Finding the half-life of a radioactive isotope is actually pretty simple. First, you start by looking at the highest point on the graph. This is 80 counts per second on this example. Now that we have the count rate, we have to half this to 40 counts per second. We then need to see where this intersects with the curve. This corresponds to 6 days. We can double check if this is a half-life by then halving this, which will give us 20 and then intersecting that with the curve again. This is now 12 days, but we started on day 6, so that's another 6 days. And doing that again is another 6 days. See if you can use this technique to work out the half-life of uranium-238. Just like before, we look at the highest number. This is 100% at this point. We go to 50, intersect it with our curve, and that gives us 4,500 million years. And there we go, the mission is complete. We've done all of paper one physics now, so all of paper one biology, physics, chemistry is done. The playlist are over here. I'll go through some past paper questions now to help you prepare for your paper one exams, and then we'll move on to paper twos, okay? So I'll see you then.